Yeah. All right, I think we're getting started, guys. And gals. <coughs> Thanks for coming out today for the uh, C launch party for uh, the Twister score. Uh, my name's Tim Grieving. I wrote the liner notes for the soundtrack. Um, and we're looking at the composer, Mark Mancina, and the director, Jan Bont. <laughs> Coming out, guys. Sure. Okay. When's the last time you guys saw each other? That's twice. It was time. <laughs> a long time. Very long. Maybe eight years now. At actually. least. Yeah. Ten years. That's a long time. It's been a long yeah, we're just catching up. Me too. Though. <laughs> <laughs> we have the same color hair now. Yeah. <laughs> Can you believe it's been 21 years since Chris came out? Um, Except that his kids are grown up that next Yeah, time. that's kind of a, But they were, they were yeah. babies when the movie was made, but not at 20. Running around the studio. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they're not 25 and 26, so that's a long time. <laughs> so there's a lot to talk about, but I wanted to start at the, how you guys ended up working together in Needy, which was on speed. Mm -hmm. And you would, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, you went, you, were, you went to get Hans Zimmer for that score because you thought he had done True Romance. Yeah, you yeah. that you yeah. were in True Romance. Yeah. That you That's, so can yeah. you talk about that? Yeah, actually the reason I liked that because it was a very unconventional score. And at first Peter was also looking for a very unconventional score, meaning like, if you listen to a lot of film music, it tends to be all big orchestras and, and, and you have the couple of themes and then, it, you know, it gets endlessly repeated. But I wanted to also have a different type of instrumentation, and I know and, uh, when I met uh, Mark at uh, uh, Zim, uh, uh, that he was also a record producer and, and a musician. And I really wanted to get elements of rock dance in my score, not just like only beautiful big orchestras, but always basically, because this was going to be a rough movie in this city that's full of, you know, it's not all about pretty things, it's about all about rough images, and. And, and life in LA is not necessarily always a romantic or, or, or beautiful place. So I wanted to get a rougher side of it. And Mark was like amazing in using all different kinds of instrumentation. And, and, and we also looked, we got, um, also, uh, um, we got some uh, different, uh, like, like we used like electronic things as well. Mm -hmm. that. But that, that's, the, that's the main thing. It's like the whole movie is one big long score, so one big race sequence. So how the hell can you make it interesting for two hours? And and can you so that the team doesn't become endlessly repetitive and how can you and also that it still tells the story. Because the, the, the music score has only one function. That's basically it is that replaces the dialogue where this where the story cannot be told by dialogue, the music will take that place and, and it's needed for that uh, for that occasion. So then we started talking about what can we do to keep that one drive, that endless chase. How can we keep it exciting and, and so different sounding? And I think there's a lot that is also apart from the different motives you create. There's also the instrumentation was so was so exciting. It's really a hybrid. Yeah, of, it's, yeah, of, exactly. Of, yeah. of sounds. Well, this guy, um, I wouldn't have a career if it wasn't for this guy. Because this guy stuck his neck out. They didn't, you know, my side of the story and his side of the story were probably a little different because. The studio did not want me to do a movie. They had no interest in doing a movie. Because I didn't have I didn't have a question of background. And so they kept calling my agent and telling me to stop that I was not on the movie and they, I would never be on the movie. And then Yon would be bouncing over to my studio and go, All right, so let's hear, you know, and I'd say, But they told me I'm not doing it. And he'd say, Don't listen. We just keep going. Just keep going. <laughs> it doesn't always work, but sometimes it doesn't work. <laughs> So I, I was really confused, but I just believed in the movie so much and what Jan was doing. So I just kind of kept it going. And I, at a certain point, I realized I think I am doing the movie. I think it's going to work. I think I am going to work. Well, I, I kept getting told I wasn't. Uh, but, uh, you know, everybody in the world didn't want to use an unknown, and he had this great film going. and. and he stuck, he stuck up for me, which does not happen in this industry. I mean, you guys know that. It, people don't do that. Uh, but he did. And uh, saw it through to the end of the film. And um, it changed everybody that was in that film and me. It changed our, it changed our careers. You know, Sandra Bullock, all these people took off after that. And, and that's his vision. So I appreciate it. Yeah, but it's also, but if you, I don't know if you still remember the movie. I mean, I, I had 
I have to say, I kind of forgot what it all looked. So I had to look at it again to really remember all the scenes. And then I actually noticed how exciting it was to really see those, those endless driving scenes and, 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 and the driving scene, how, how the many variants he, he created for me that kept, kept every scene original again. But if you really look at the beginning of that movie, basically it's the elevator scene, which is a 41 story scene where the, um, uh, basically the camera goes from, from all the way to the top of the building to till you reach the basement. That scene is, that shot is, I think, two and a half minutes long. And that has all the themes of the movie in that one score, piece of score. And it was so beautifully done, and so beautifully, um, uh, the, the changeovers. It was, it was really a score. It wasn't a, a, not a montage, I think. He really made all the themes work in one particular shot. And then, if you, once you know that, you see the movie, you think, oh shit, yeah, that was there, that was there. <laughs> so he came up, you came already up with, with the score, and I think that's why also the studio really liked it when they saw that, when they heard that. They felt relieved, and they were like, oh my god, he can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's really, I said that, that, that first part is, I think to me, is, 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 is the core of the movie because it really subconsciously so prepares the audience for what you're going to see, what this all is going to be about. And that is, pretty unique that you can do that in one piece of music. So I, uh, that to me was like looking at it again, I think was actually a revelation because I didn't remember it that well. I know because everything was done so quickly and rushed a little bit that we, the score, everything was mixed maybe like two weeks before the movie came out. So it was all really, there was no time left to really take it all in. And and I was sitting back and looking at, looking at it again. I think it's a really, really exciting score. If you said, just look at that one shot at the beginning, because it's musically, it's fantastic. Really quite fine. So you had a good time on Speed. It did well for everybody. The next project you possibly would have worked on together was Godzilla, which you were prepping right. to direct. And right. that would have been an interesting what if for you. But it didn't pan out for various reasons, and Twister came along. And your first exposure to Twister was on the set, right? You got to actually visit... So, he, so this is great, because I, I don't remember what scene you were doing. You might remember, but they flew me out... Iowa? Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, the, the, many places in Nebraska, Iowa, Oklahoma, and a kind of tornado alley is called. So, I, so I, I show up, and they drive me out to this big field, and I see this red truck, and I see this crazy guy, <laughs> under the truck, somehow harnessed somehow with, with the camera, and they're flying down the road, and there's big wind turbines blowing things across, and I, just, I saw all this, and I went, this guy's crazy. You know? I, didn't, I didn't realize, I mean, he's a, he was a cinematographer, so I didn't realize that, you know, how hands-on he is, and how he's willing to put himself into those things he wants to get the shot he wants to get. You know? So the, the amazing shooting on that movie, and, and on Speed, too, uh, is due to him. But I just kept thinking, oh man, I'm going to have to write some really great music to, to keep up with what I think I'm seeing here. So. And if you know anything about his career as a cinematographer, that was a calm day at work. Right? <laughs> that, was a very, that was kind of a boring day at work. Yeah, that was like, yeah, that was one of the more relaxing days. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, mean, because it's, I mean, even if you look at it, right from the, the, the first tornado, you know, it's like you have to remember a little bit, I realized that in those days um, computer generated images were not so well known yet and, and there was very little experience with it. And normally you do it always, you put a camera steady, cannot move the camera and then they can change it, but that's not what I wanted. The, basically most of the movies shot handheld and they all said no, 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 we cannot do that, no. And we talked to many um, uh, visual effects companies, and none of them wanted to do it because they said, wait, we don't know how to. And then finally, uh, ILM, and one particular guy, Stefan uh, Fangmeier, who was the, 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 basically the designer of it, he said, okay, I think, I think I found a way. I mean, but that still then took six months to really, to really get this first. So, so for, to get a movie like this to look like a, basically like one long documentary, is it is visual effects wise in those days was unheard of and quite amazing and basically ILM lost a lot of money on it because it took them almost a year longer to get all the effects done because they had no idea they had to invent software to really get it done which is really pretty amazing and that was, 
the particle system was not used everywhere by everybody. That was designed for that particular movie and for nothing else. And 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 without that, we would have never been able to create a tornado. Too. Every tornado has about 25 million particles, and 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 they're all individually moved. So to they totally underestimated how long that would be and how many tornadoes that were in the movie and how long the shots would be. You know, that's all, because every shot, a shot of four seconds or a shot of 25 seconds, that takes um, eight times as long, <laughs> simple like that. So it doesn't matter how long a shot is, it all takes, per, per frame takes the same amount of time. But anyway, we have to get back to the, to the school for that, because it is, there's, I, I felt like we had, there's, again, this is, it's, it is a little bit chase, it is a competitive chase, and there's a lot of drama in this movie. So we talk to Mark. We, we have to get a lot of themes here, you know, because there's a lot of things that we have to, you know, because there's not always dialogue there. There's like, I wanted just a lot of the stuff speaks for itself, and I want it to be like, you know, real tornado chasers. That's what they do. You know, they sit and cut down cars and drive as fast as they can, try to be ahead of a tornado or behind it. And that, uh, that feeling I really wanted to recreate as well. And, and therefore it looks like rough and hands out and so like a, but, but we have to create themes and then we can, we figured out, my God, there's actually a lot of things happening now. There's, uh, first of all, like a main theme, which is kind of the lyrical theme of the movie, which you see when the helicopter flies over that wheat field, really long shot, and it ends up close on the two guys, the, the Helen and Bill on the car. That is the main theme of the movie. No? And, and then from there on, almost everything else changes. That, we, that, that theme, I think, comes back twice more in the home with it. That's and it comes back at the very end. Yeah, yeah, the very end, yeah. But everything else is basically, you know, you have a theme for the Twister, a theme for Bill, for Helen. You have a theme for the competition, for the urgency, for the destructive power. So all is all, there was a lot more themes than we both imagined, but that's what the, I was a little bit worried about that. But then uh, and, uh, Mark com completely convinced me that no, no, that's exactly the way we should do it because it cannot be, you know, not, we cannot treat everything the same way musically. And he came up basically for every twist there was a different theme. If you listen to the movie carefully, you notice that it's all different. There's not a single part the same in. And also the instrumentation and those, those, those long guitar solos that are in the score. When we hear guitar solos that are howling, as Ed Neville did that, who did some of the, and Deep Purple well, Trevor, also. Trevor did and some Trevor of Trevor did some of it, and then we had Deep Purple in there. Yeah. That was, that, that, that was, was interesting. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> he gives me that assignment. Yeah. It was T A Child in Time by Deep Purple. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. Oklahoma, yeah. and it was uh, William Tell Overture. Yeah. Superimposed on top of each other. And, yeah. and it's all one part, well, it's all one, one, one composition, the whole thing. It's that. Right, it's, it's, all, right, it's all going at the same time. Yeah, yeah. That was crazy. And that was, <laughs> was fantastic. I thought, you know, if you can do that, you can do everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's break it down a little bit. Start, start with that opening theme. What, what kind of led to you writing this kind of Aaron Copeland Americana theme? I love Aaron Copeland, first. Of all. Yeah, that's so, actually, that's perfect. That's so, I mean, I, and I actually got to spend time with Aaron Copeland when I was in college, so it was pretty amazing. But, um, well, you know, when I saw the dailies and I saw scenes from the movie, I felt like they were, this movie is going to last a long time. It felt like, and you, you hate to use the word, but it felt like a classic. Too. And so I felt like it needed a classic theme. It needed something really legitimate to kind of hold it together and make it deep. And so that was one of the first things I wrote, was that, that panning shot the helicopter over the wheat fields. I um, just wanted to give it size. I wanted to put us, you know, in the middle of America. and. Wanted to give it a character and, and all of that, but as he says, it sets you up, you know, that everything's wonderful and great, and isn't this amazing? And wow, this is exciting, but things are going to turn bad real soon. <laughs> yeah, and it's also, it, but it's also, it is a beautiful landscape too. Yeah. If you just, yeah. And the beauty of the land, and and, and like you can see in, in Oklahoma and, and other many movies that that show that those 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 uh, different states, it is really beautiful. Mm. And that was the whole point. It's like there's not destruction later on, so let's really make it look as beautiful and have the score really support that. Uplifting. So, yeah, oh, exactly. Lyrical, uplifting. But still, yeah, there's always a little bit of a sense that something is going to happen. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah. John, why did you want kind of a rock and roll? I know that that was something you had asked for specifically, yeah, was electric yeah. guitar and kind yeah. of a rock influence. Why did you want that flavor in this score? Because I think with, with those instruments, especially also this percussion, there's so much you can do, and there's so much, the, 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 the rhythms in percussion 
in all the different scenes is is some completely different and, 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 and quite spectacular in my opinion because it really creates a feeling of not only an incredible drive and impact but it really already sets you up for things that might happen and it, so it creates a sense of excitement but also danger and it really most importantly it, it keeps that speed that drive in the movie going non-stop mm -hmm. and, and without it being repetitive. And you mentioned to me that you, you feel like a lot of uh, film scores are kind of removed from everyday life if it's an orchestra or something and right. it was important to you to have like instruments you actually hear in these locations and on the radio and stuff as part of the score as well. Yeah, absolutely, because when, I, I don't know if anybody of you has ever driven this one of those tornado chases, but they all play loud music in their cars. <laughs> really loud, they have bass, big bass speakers, and, and that's all they do. So I thought, well, if that's what they listen to, we should have that as well. So there's a lot of source music as well. There's mm -hmm. a lot of songs yeah. that we pick, but they're, because that's what they listen to, you know? And then so, so the moment there's there's always basically um, um, source music when there's dialogue and there's a little bit of background and the score the moment the dialogue starts because then the score is continuing to tell the story and and, and builds on on the dialogue and that makes it actually a really great mix so you see a lot of contemporary and listen to a lot of contemporary score but I mean and some and most of it's also composed by the way it's not only only source music so it's it's, it's really extremely good combination and it feels more alive you know mm -hmm. any, any time there's a big score I mean I love scores but in a movie like this it wouldn't wouldn't work you know it's too it's it's too it can become too dramatic and too over the top too quickly and and it there's there is a, a build is very hard to uh, sustain for a long time but if you use um, contemporary music and special rock and roll or uh, then you can really make anything. But well, you have a lot more tools in your toolbox. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Now, Mark, your phrase when I mentioned some of this was that you thought rock and roll scores can be corny. It can be. So how did sure. you how did you avoid that? How did you? Oh, I don't know if I did. I think I did, but I don't know. Um, <laughs> how did you go about infusing that that ingredient into a kind of a traditional orchestral film score? Well, hmm. the one thing that can sound really corny is a real bluesy guitar, if it's not. Well done. It just can sound dated with yeah. an orchestra. It can just you know not really blend together. I try to keep um, acoustic guitars rolling through a lot of the score, strumming. You know, like Jan was saying, it's momentum is what what you want out of the music. For this. You want, want the, you don't want the audience to ever feel bogey. You know, so so the the momentum can come from, of course, it can come from percussion, but it can also come from acoustic guitars. It can also come from electric guitar. It can also come from drums. So, you know, I played with that. I, had a, I have a lot of acoustic guitars in that score besides electric. And you played a lot of the acoustics? I played a lot of the acoustics. I think the electrics were Trevor and I don't remember. I had another guy. I can't think of who it was. But the electric is used really creatively. Like, you have that kind of whale song yeah, kind yeah. of effect yeah. near the beginning. Yeah. You have some more traditional kind of, you know, rock out yeah. wailing electric guitar. But there's some really cool... You do some interesting things with that's that. Why I, that's why I wanted, I mean, when he said electric guitar, I, I was great, but I want to make sure I don't do something that sounds like, oh, remember that, you know, two years later, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, that was kind of, yeah. I didn't want it to sound that way. No, I think, I think the instrument, instrumentation of, uh, especially the guitar solos, it is, it is quite unique because um, it's also a little bit like the voice of the tornado a little bit because that howling sound, if you ever heard a tornado or it is, it's not, it's like a massive amount of bass sound. I mean, really overwhelming. And then there's some really shrieking, I mean, like sounds that go right through that, like as if metals bending up. And those things, I think, are that for the guitars are, because they are like really fit perfectly in that. So that's why I, I think it was such a great choice to do that. And whose idea was it to kind of score the tornadoes themselves with choir and why? Oh, this is idea, wasn't it? Yeah, no, it was, uh, we can each take credit. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> no. yeah I don't remember. No, 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 I think we should. But, but, but you know why? Because I, I never thought of it, but then I really, when he started show, listening, showing things to me, so, that it actually that makes completely sense, you know, because Tornadoes always have names, then, and they, but quite often they give them. It's not just an F1. After they give them, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, Amelia, or they give them. All people who live there. They all give them those tornadoes a name, and it became that makes those things come personal. 
And I think the choir, the, the voices in it is also, you hear that in the beginning too, in the very opening of the movie when you get the credits and the building, this building score, beautiful. And there's uh, sounds in it that are a lot of um, sounds of, of, of uh, um, um, males, of the baby, Daisy, and very high all mixed together. And some wine sounds too, but uh, that, but it's all together mixed, mixed with an incredible, like a little bit like a, it is becomes an individual. It, it becomes more that it's just not just a one note thing, the tomato. The, the yeah. Had you worked with choir much before that? Well, I guess maybe in college, but not, we had the LA Master Chorale, so it was pretty cool, pretty decent, pretty cool. Yeah, they were really and I had Don Harper, who I worked with for years and years, and he was conducting, and, and you know, so it was, and we did a lot of experimenting, you know, we did a lot of clustering and effecty kind of vocal stuff. Yeah. So it wasn't just traditional, you know, vocal. He mentioned this earlier, but in terms of trying to actually not just show it all up front, but actually escalate with each Tornado, how did you... Well, there isn't any you know? choir up front, you know, at all, you know, so I waited, I held it off, and then when, when you start to, first few tornadoes, you get little tastes of it. It isn't really until the drive-in, which is the greatest yeah, scene. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's where it That was so much fun to score that. That's like a dream score when you get to, to do something like that. Because the scene already worked amazingly without me, so I just was able to... Yeah, yeah, but that but that scene would be nothing without the score because there's no dialogue now. And right, there's no dialogue. Yeah, and that's so you 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 replace the storytelling with 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 elements and music that tell a story, and that's what was really needed and necessary, so that you can create a build. You know, you cannot just do a level of score. Right. Now it's really still that's the most important thing of any score is. You continue telling a story, and and the music has to do that. If it doesn't do that, it's kind of, it, 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 it kind of doesn't have any function anymore. It, it's also if you if you listen to the drive-in music, and it, this doesn't always work, so it's not a formula. But if if the if the tension's escalating really a lot and it's getting really tense, if the music slows down, it's even hard. It's even more uh, frightening than if you just speed up with the film speed up. So th th it's, big, it's big long sweeps of uh, chord changes, very slow, and just thre like tornadoes are, you know, just threatening, you know, and then pulling back a little bit and then coming towards you. And uh, so it's got this uh, menacing, menacing feel to it. It's not something that you would just listen to and just put it on and take a shower, you know. It's, it's, <laughs> walk down the aisle. It's, it's, it's pretty threatening, yeah. <laughs> I actually have that scene queued up, but I seem to lost my, uh, can someone grab Taylor and see if he has the uh, Apple TV remote? I want to play that just so we can oh, cool. get a nice right feel here. for it. Oh, uh, it looks like it. <laughs> Somebody sat on it. <laughs> you win the prize, right? <laughs> All right. I would never find it. Yeah. So yeah, they, that's a great example of, because you have all this momentum throughout the score, but here you, you slow it down in that sort of glacial, like... End of times. Yeah, end of yeah. times. It, it speaks to like the, the, the gravity and the majesty of these, of these uh, weather events. That, but I think there's one other thing that's important to, to, uh, to know, and, and the, the reason that I think the call of the voices work so well here, because it's also incredibly beautiful to look at. I mean, if you see a tornado, it is fattening, it is overwhelming, but it is really, really spectacular. And I think there's some to the beauty of seeing the tornado that's also kind of this, this the, 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 the voices help that make him come alive as well. Because I really wanted to showcase that nature is pretty beautiful too. I mean, not only powerful, but in its power, it really can be extremely beautiful. Yeah, it's almost religious in a way. It is, yeah. It's you can't look away. You can't take your eyes off it, but it's horrifying. So I imagine you were working with, like, rough effects when you were writing. <laughs> yeah, they didn't sound like that. <laughs> yeah. So what what did you take inspiration from to find the score? What, what, what on the screen or just conceptually were you, like, latching on to to find this music? Uh, well, I mean, there were certain sound effects on the the different versions of the film that I was working on, so I kind of knew 
I knew that I was going to be up against a lot of stuff. So I tried to write to be to make to make it work with that stuff going on. You know, instead of writing something really thick and dense and then realizing, well, they just have to turn it all down, so I'm going to write right here. That's one of the reasons I did that also, the swells, because you can, you, you know, if I was playing throughout that, you, you, would, you probably wouldn't hear it. You know, you would thought, so. um, but I don't know, I think, I think each scene was inspiring because of what the scene was about. That one was so much fun, you know. But there's also different, there's an emotional scene in the movie between the two of them, a relationship situation, and that was really fun to write. And, but they all required different, like he said, it, it wasn't, you know, speed was, Speed had a main theme, and then it had the little, the little riff, you know. The dun, 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 dun. Uh, yeah, those kind of kept things. Faster than that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's my older version of that. Uh, it kind of kept things going, but but this movie was it kind of kept evolving. So the music kind of needed to kind of keep evolving. But what is what, one other thing that is uh, always interesting to talk about is that when you make those movies, um, that there always is at the end a huge fight against between all the mixers, the sound effects creators, and the score. And, and I really wanted that, I knew that was going to happen, and at the same time, I wanted all the sound effects. And, but, but it's to find a balance. So, so what, what, what the way it is mixed is they all get their turn. Mm -hmm. And if you listen carefully, the music never disappears when you need to hear it, and the effects will, will disappear a little bit, and they come right back when the theme is over. And, so it's a really nice balance back and forth. And so it's not like a battle. It's not like, oh, you know, we were trying to fade away the music. No, no, no. It is right there when you want to hear it. And the sound effects are, of course, as important as music. I mean, sometimes sound effects become music, and sometimes music become part of the sound effects with little things in there. So they can really work together very well. And in and, and this, and this movie, I think, I was able to convince all the mixers that don't push your thing forward, don't do this. Really, it's the, the point is that we have to hear them both, and you, you have to hear them all at the right moment. And, 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 and that was a little bit of a battle, I have to say, because there's always a lot of sound mixes involved, and, and, and uh, this, this sound team was pretty massive. I think it's like yeah. 30 people, Huge. 40. Huge. Yeah. So, but, and, and, but it's interesting, but I think it's like, you, if you hear it over big speakers, nothing is fighting each other. So even here, you can hear actually yeah. even the smallest sound effect, right. and you can hear all the score. You can hear those long building notes, and there's nothing. Right. It's all has its place. You got kind of typecast as an action guy after these movies, and that did a bunch of those. What was special about working with Jan? What we're talking about like the balance of sound effects versus music and themes, and the ability to. Well, he he loves themes, so. You know, praise the Lord for that because that's, that seems to be gone in, in some respects. And it's very it's hard for me because I grew up, you know, listening to Ennio Morricone and and, uh, and all these amazing composers in their thematic. And it's hard to write good things. It's very hard. Yeah. Um, so I miss that. I love leaving a theater having seen something and have that theme in my head. I like that feeling, you know. And I like being able to associate a theme to a movie. And I think there's a lot of fear of that nowadays. I think that a lot of directors feel like, yeah, but if that way, then, then when they hear that theme, they go, oh, yeah, it's kind of dated feeling, you know? But I just don't think so. I just think when you hear Raiders of the Lost Ark, man, you know what it is. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm from that school. There's, a, there's different schools. That's the school I'm from. So Jan was very much into themes. Jan would have, if I would have just played him a wallpaper, which is what I call it, which is just stuff, he wouldn't have gone for it. He would have said, well, where's... Yeah, what's the theme? What's no, the I, I agree totally with this, Mark, in that respect. I think uh, because it, it, you, when you look at a movie, you want to hear something that keeps everything together. The writing, uh, the dialogue, the visuals, the score. And it, it becomes like one, 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 basically, memory that should all belong together and not just like, oh, I remember a little bit of music, a little bit. That would be good for any movie. and. Like let's say if you look at Dr. Zhivago or so, or those <laughs> David Lee movies, where the score can by itself tell the whole story. Mm -hmm. I mean like you can, the scenes that last five or even longer, but it's only score. And, and Lars of Arabia, there's a lot of those movies that, and that actually, that helps to tell the complete story. So there's like one voice through the whole movie that is, that is coherent and that really moves forward to, to uh, find all the cells at the end. Yeah. 
in some ways, Twister is the end of an era of filmmaking because you have so many, I mean, we're talking about cutting edge digital graphics and stuff, but you had so much practical, physical sets and explosions and all sorts of things on camera, and then this sort of like beautiful theme and variation score for an action movie, like it's just, it's not dated, I don't think, but it's, they don't make movies like this anymore. No, they can't. So it's kind of a unique, yeah. And it's, yeah. But then actually, so but but they help each other too because <laughs> I see it in a split second on any movie, if it's digital or real and or or, or on camera. And I wish I didn't, to be honest. But, but I, it's, it's an, 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 an impossible for me to not see it. But what I was trying to do is like that they make them inseparable. That they are they look like one thing. So when you see those combiners fall from the sky, and when the, there are real combiners falling from the sky, you know, <laughs> hanging from helicopters and dropping down. Oh, yeah. And and there are other times there are things that are totally uh, in the sky, made visually by official effects. And then the, <coughs> the the effects on the ground are totally real. So the combination makes it for a much bigger event. And like when, for instance, when the car is driving through the hailstorm, it's real hail, not it's real ice, and it really hurts. And it's yeah. real blood. It's real blood on, on, on them. But, but so that by doing that, by mixing it up evenly, it is it becomes like a much more coherent movie, and you don't you're not distracted by either sloppy effects here or uh, quite often even the visual effects are not always done very well. So you're kind of making it so that you, it becomes one movie where you really don't you don't want to see and rec recognize what is what. And that was a little bit my goal behind it all. But that he, it's too expensive right now. You cannot do that. Then. Mark, I know like actors say it's easier for them to give a good performance when they're like in a real location versus surrounded by green screen or working with someone with like white balls over their face and stuff. Mm -hmm. For as a composer, are you do you have more to? Are you more inspired, or is it easier for you to, to write music when you're looking at real stuff like that versus? I know you work a lot in animation. And yeah, I mean, it, you know, stuff. I think going to the set is really valuable. I think that all, you know, as a composer, I, I'm not in the process that early usually with a film. Mm -hmm. uh, but going to the set and really seeing how much they put into just this, like, it would be as if they sit with me as I'm writing the score and then they realize, whoa, that took you, that 30 seconds took you three days? That's crazy, you know, but... That's how, it is. That's, yeah, right. That's how it is for all of us, and I think it, it helps to understand more of filmmaking and what what the director's going through to get this to me, and, and, and possibly the backstory, too, because you know, the way that something's cut together and, and what the director might be seeing, it might not be in the temp, or it might not be able to be communicated. It's really hard to talk about music. You know, it's a weird, music's a weird thing. It's like, um, I, wanted to, I just wanted to tell you my two really quick uh, I think funny stories. Maybe one's funny, one's not funny. One's very sad. No. Uh, but you have to understand this guy. So he calls. He calls me. I'm working on this. He calls me and he says, "Oh, you got to go over to Eddie Van Halen." I said, "Eddie Van Halen." He goes, "Yeah, you got to go over there. Here's the address. You got to go." So I, I go drive over to Eddie Van Halen's house, and then Alex and Eddie are there in the studio, and they want to play me a song they're writing for the movie. What I don't realize is that Eddie can't hear very well. So when he listens to music, it needs to be loud. But well, I listen to music loud, but this is not loud like you have ever heard before. <laughs> so he's like, Mark, listen to this. And he turns this thing on. The, the pencils come off the console. <laughs> My hair, I had more hair, <laughs> blows back. And I, it was just like I was hearing, uh, uh, like, you know, just it was so loud. I, I couldn't even hear what I was hearing. And then after he played it, he's like, what do you think? And I went, wow, I was... Really loud. <laughs> and so Alex was kind of the translator. So Alex was saying, no, that was too loud, Eddie. You can't listen to it that loud. Turn it down a little bit so you can hear. So that was kind of fun. Then another thing he did uh, one day was he called me to come over to a dub stage somewhere. He wanted to show me the trailer. Do you guys remember the original trailer for Swiss Turn? Because it was, it, was it was a mind blower. And it was the first time anybody had ever done it, right? right because it was, you know, it was black, completely black. And then you see the twister, and then it's completely black. Now, that kind of trailer we've seen now a million times. But this was the first time it was done. So that, that had, again, I, 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 he showed it to me because it was so exciting. But I went back to my studio, and it, it, it was like, okay, this is going to be really great. I got to make sure these scenes are really great. I got to really hunker down here. You know, it was just inspiring in that way. That's awesome.
Let's uh, take a few questions if you guys have any, and then we can uh, wrap it up and move on into the, the signing room. Yeah. Uh, so did you actually get to see a real tornado? You mentioned it. And yeah, I was there. I was, I was there a long time. A little too long. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, now you, the thing is that you actually really, in the beginning, before we started shooting, um, is we went with a lot of those <laughs> tornado chases going around the country, and they actually know where it's going to happen. Which is really scary, but what I what I never believed is that when you see those guys in the movie make suddenly a left turn into the field, or they actually do that, and that was scary to me because I listen. I mean, like I had no idea there were um, gullies there or bridges, or they have not. They just go right into the field towards the tornado and wait till the very last moment. And then they quickly turn around. <laughs> it's like really, it's like that it was. It, it's it, that one was. I mean, was only I think an F two and F three, which is still really big if you're close by. Let me tell you that, and really, really loud. So, so yes, uh, I think that's why I felt I had a really, you know, the, so that thing in the garage, so that sequence. That's how how it felt like to me. It's like so overwhelming. It is, you know. I want to make sure that that would come across. That it is not so. Oh, an artificially made, made, made uh, created uh, tornado, but it's really, it is, you have all those fly, that's flying debris, you know, which became like a, a, a slogan in the movie, more debris, more debris, because I always wanted more. And, and it, it's pretty stunning if you see that we have like those big jet engines and 15 gigantic wind machines and all okay. that at the same time. And, uh, Plus visual facts in the background, so everything you see in the photo is always real. You know, when they walk through debris, it's kind of a real debris, and sometimes it blurred a little bit when it hits you. And, and so the actors were once, I mean, regularly pretty pissed off, but <laughs> but at the same time they could see when they saw it, then they saw it was so real. They said, "Yeah, well, it was real because it was real. No, it didn't look real because of." Of I mean, it was real because it really the debris, and I tried to make as as much soft debris as possible, meaning, you know, <laughs> nothing to steal in it. No, no. You know, it, re it reminds me. I was in Nashville about five or six years ago. Do you guys know hear about that massive tornado there? Yeah, yeah. I was right in the center of that tornado with my friend Marlon over there, and. Uh, what I remember about it was, it was getting so scary, and I asked somebody in one of the stores, and it was like we were on like a little strip of drug stores and things, and I asked one of the people that worked in the store, is there going to be a big tornado? And she said, don't worry about it unless it turns green outside. And I went, green? And then I went, going green. In this movie, they say it's going green. I never knew what that meant. In fact, one of the pieces of music in the score is called Going Green. But I never knew what that meant until that moment. And then it turned green. And, I, and it was like, it turns green. And, and, and then it comes. And it's beyond frightening. It Why does it turn green? It, it is atmospheric. It's, it's basically a combination of, of the of ultraviolet and... and, and uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, how do you call it? Uh, the infrared. When the demands start to differ very dramatically, and if you mix those together as a red blue green, you you find it, you you it really goes green. That scene that we that's in the movie that actually it did go green. So it is it is not when when it's, it's not that green like the months on that, but it is it, it's green. It's green it's enough. Green, it's blue <laughs> blue green a little bit, but they call it green. Science lesson. Yeah. <laughs> Before I get to the question, I just want to tell you, that scene where they go to Aunt Meg's house and they have that steak and eggs and the mashed potatoes, that has become like a tradition for me. Every time I watch that movie, I have to have steak and eggs. Yeah, steak you know, that had the same potatoes. effect on me. Too. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at it, they throw that steak down on top of the eggs. It's, gigantic. Oh, yeah. it's a gigantic steak, and I go, man, I got to have it. <laughs> but the uh, question is, how many cars or vehicles did you destroy in this movie? <laughs> um, you must have wrecked that truck a bunch of times. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, uh, I, I think that the, the red truck, we had probably 15 to 20. Um, the other trucks, multiples, like four or five each. Um, I mean, this, then uh, you will see a lot of flying <coughs> cars, of course, that every real day. Once they fall, they're done for. Really, really, um, the combiners are real, so once they're done, they fall down, they're done for those, I think 15. 
Some of helicopters, the plane is a real accord. Uh, not the plane, not, not, not the plane, the, um, um, how do you call it, the, uh, the scene before, uh, before, the, oh, no, the, the car shooting into the, into the, into the garage, that's a real car on a wire going at super high speed into the building, very close to the reactor, but not close enough to hit them. <laughs> um, not, I don't know, I mean, if you, uh, uh, let's say in, 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 in speed, I know exactly how many cars we destroyed. There was about close to 270, I think, altogether. You <laughs> hate cars. <laughs> <laughs> and how many cows? But actually, we, we saw a picture of a cow once. That's why it's based on uh, of about with the cow in the tree. I thought, wow, that's pretty nice. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, we've seen where you grab the camera on speed. You're you're on top of the subway with Keanu, right in the middle of it. In filming either one of those films, what was the hardest thing for you to achieve as a, with the camera in your hands? Well, the thing is that I, I, I've been a, a filmmaker for a long time. I always tend to talk to the actors when I'm filming. So even if they're dialogue, I have, they can see by, by they can lip read me and say a little bit more, more and, and I'll, do, I'll do it again. Because quite often, the director says, one take is enough. And I know it's not good, so I said we can, and I will keep shooting till I think it's good, and then, and then we stop. So I have a kind of a, an, 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 uh, some directors love it, others don't like it, that I just keep saying no, it has to be over and over again. But is the what I really want is that I see it's always the actor, and I want to see that initial reaction on whatever event happens, and that's why all those reaction shots in this too, they're always done by myself because. You know, I can see, I, you cannot see on the, on the screen, on the little monitor, how actors react. It's impossible. They couldn't do it 50 years ago, they still can. So you have to be really be this close to really see if it's a fake reaction or if it's a real reaction. And the best thing is to never really tell the actors exactly what's going to happen. <laughs> so then it's, it's quite often more real. But, 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 and if it, you don't get it, you have to do it over and over again. And, and I think that's, and operators, are, because they don't know what I'm looking for, it's so hard to express, you know, like, what, you, what is it that you really want for, for, an, uh, for an actor? And it's, because you, I worked on so many action movies before that, I said, that the dialogue was always the same. And I was like, oh, look at you, look at you. That's always the same thing. There's like, what, 20, 20 or 25 uh, short lines they have for all action movies, and they all use them every time over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> but but I try to avoid it because it's much better to see a reaction of face without having to scream, and that, and that works much better than, than than just using one of those incredibly repetitive lines. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, what was it? What was it like working with some of the actors? Like, was it actually, the, the one thing I, I was lucky, you know, because um, initially when Keanu was. Uh, I, I would. I wanted him for the movie, but I did not know that he was afraid. Actually, it was not so. He looked in the movie like he's really guts, you know, and like he jumped from car to car. Man, he he actually didn't dare to do that. I had to really show it to him and show him jump from car to car, and I told him, "Listen, if I can do it, you can do it too. I guarantee you." <laughs> and it took that that thing. It seemed as a jaguar that you gets ripped mm -hmm. off. Man, it took like almost a day to get him to get from the car to the head. <laughs> well, basically, you, when you both go the same speed, it doesn't matter. You are stationary. So basically, sort of walking from there to there. But if the, if the streets fly by and all the traffic flies by, it looks dangerous. But it is not as dangerous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 we'll do one more. I'll write in the back. Um, Mark, what was your favorite uh, film to compose so far? <laughs> you know, um, I don't know, that's a tough one because different films at different times were, I mean, Speed was a big deal and really fun and it was kind of a breakthrough, so that was really important. Um, August Rush was really, really fun and Moana was really hard 
probably the hardest I've ever done. Why would you say that? Well, it was it was uh, developed over three years, and you know, Lynn, who I wrote the songs with, was in New York and became the most famous person in the universe during that movie. <laughs> then the other guy was Opataya, who lives in New Zealand. So you know, getting everybody in Carmel was not easy, you know, and and, uh, and you know that's where I live, but. Trying to get, I would go to New York. I go to New Zealand. It was really geographically difficult, and they didn't finish the, the kind of the story until pretty late in the day. So it was, it was tricky. These guys will be signing CDs in that room back there. I want to thank both of you guys for coming out. And